Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're talking about files. This is a new section, and we are really getting into the exciting stuff now. After these few videos, particularly in this section and in the next section, our programs are going to be able to save their status so that we can continue later. By the way, just as an advance, in the next section, we'll look at databases. Cool stuff. For example, we could write a program to store the books we want to read, and they won't be forgotten when the program ends and we start it again. That way we can really start developing larger applications now that, you know, the information they hold starts to persist across runtimes. From this section onwards, we're going to be focusing more on building apps as opposed to just learning about concepts, which is really useful. You, I mean, you have to know um, what you're typing before you start typing it. But the best thing to do is to actually write code, of course, and develop some apps. So I'd like to apologize if you have been bored over the last few sections just learning, you know, how to do things with Python. Now we're going to build apps and things are going to get more exciting, I promise you. And also, we're going to be writing all our code on PyCharm, as we've been doing. Instead of REPL it, we're going to start forgetting about REPL it as we focus more on these larger apps. In REPL it, you can't interact with files and databases and other good stuff, so that's why we, we must stop using it now. If you want, if you want to ask any questions about particular pieces of code, you can still post your code on REPL it, and I'll definitely be able to look at it uh, easily. I've created a new project here. I've called it files underscore project, and I've created an app.py file. Because in this video, we're going to be dealing with files, particularly text files, I'm also going to right click and create a new good old normal file, and I'm going to call it data.txt. The .txt stands for .text, and this data is going to hold some text data. Now, let's talk about how we can read the contents of this data file using Python. Of course, right now it's empty, but we're going to type the name of our friend, Rolf. Just as an example, we're going to read the data in and print it out, just so you know how easy it is with Python to read some data out of a file. It's really straightforward. All we have to do is open the file, for which we have to give it the name of the file, that's data.txt, and you can see here, you've got a nice nice uh, thing in PyCharm where it tells you the arguments of this file. There's a lot. Um, there's a mode, there's a buffering, encoding, errors, and so forth. We're only going to do comma R. R is going to be the mode. Data.txt is going to be the name of the file. And the R stands for reading. We're going to open a file for reading only. Of course, this opens the file. And that does something at the operating system level. The operating system now has stored somewhere in its memory that you have this file open. And there's a certain limit to the number of files you can have open at once. Now, other than the operating system knowing that this file is now open, we must also have a way to interact with the file for which we have to, of course, store this uh, object that gets returned, it's called a file pointer, into a variable. Now that we have it on a variable, we can do things like create a new variable, which is myfile.read. .read is going to read the entire contents of the file as a single string and give it us as file content. Now, I said earlier that there is a limit to how many files you can have simultaneously open in your computer at once. I'm not lying. So the first thing is to make sure you close the file, myfile.close. That returns that uh, file opener to the operating system, and now that file is closed. If you wanted to read it again or interact with it in any other way, you would not be able to do so. However, we've already extracted what we wanted from it, that's the whole contents, and we can print them out. So that's it. That's really as simple as it gets. Let's right-click app.py and run it. And notice how now we get Rolf. Also, as a side thing, I've increased the font size of this um, command line, just for your benefit. So the, the file contents is now one long string. And when we call the dot .read method of the file, it just goes through the entire file and gives us all of its contents as a single string. If the file is really, really long, 
and some of them can be tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of lines long, you could have a problem if you decide to do this. So uh, we will learn other ways of, of going about it later on. And also remember, it's really important to close the file when we finish. Otherwise, Python thinks we still need to keep it open, and it can cause problems when the file contents uh, change. It can cause problems with having too many open at the same time as well. Now let's move on to writing to the file. I mean, reading it is fairly straightforward. Just open it on reading mode. That's important. Then you read it, then you close it, and you have the content available. Now let's write to it. After we've closed the file, that's important, we can reopen it this time for writing. So I'm going to create a my file writing variable, and that's going to be data.txt, but this time w for writing. Notice, by the way, that when we open a file for writing, that erases the contents of the file, and, and anything we write will overwrite anything that's already there. So if you want to keep the contents of your file, do not open it in w mode. There are other ways that you can use, other modes, that won't erase the data there, and instead it will keep the data there and let you edit it. Editing files, not so easy though. Um, that's, that's slightly more, more work. So now we've got the file open for writing, we can write something. We can potentially write the user's name, so that we remember it from one time we run the program to another. Where should we ask the user for their name? Should we ask for their name after we open the file? Or before we open the file? The answer is before we open the file. You don't want to have your files open for any longer than possible. And let's remember, if we have an input here, the user may never type anything. Potentially, they could just run the program and then forget about it. And then you'd have this data.txt file open, potentially for a long time. You don't want to do that. So the best thing to do is to make sure that your files are open for the smallest period of time possible. And that's almost always in a, a few lines of code where you're not asking the user to do anything. So just open them and close them as quickly as you can. We've asked the user for their name, then we've opened the file for writing, and now, of course, we can do myfile.writing, myfilewriting, and then dot. And when you do that in PyCharm, by the way, you get all of the methods and properties of the object. Remember that dot means inside. So here we're looking inside the object to see what we can use. And this is really great from PyCharm. And it lets us look at potentially what we want to close, what we want to call. So I was reading close there and I was like, what do we want to close? We don't want to close anything just yet. And, but nonetheless, you can see the close method is here. We're going to be calling that in just a moment. So going through this, there's a lot of stuff. There is uh, things that you may not understand what they mean, like readable, read line, read lines, seek. And whenever you encounter something like this that you are interested in, but you don't know what it means, Google it. It's, it's really great. The Python documentation, the official Python guides, they, they can be a bit dense, but they have a lot of information about how to use all these um, built-in functions like file wrappers and, and also information on what these things mean. But of course, we're going to go and uh, call the write method. And the write method takes in a string that we're going to write to the file. And that's going to be the user's name. Finally, of course, we must close the file. That's very important. Don't forget to do that. So now, when we run our program, the first thing we're going to do is open our file for reading print out the contents, then we're going to ask the user for their name, and then we're going to open the file for writing and write their name to the file. So if we run the file once, if we run uh, our program once, we see Rolf, that's the current contents of the file, then we can type in our name, and then the program finishes. We can run it again, and now we see that our name has appeared there, which is fantastic. It means that the file does know what's going on. If you look at the file, you can see indeed that Jose is currently in the file contents. Then I'm going to type Rolf, press enter. And if we go back to the data.txt, we see that Rolf is now in there. Over the next few videos, we're going to look at storing more than just a single string in, in the file. 
uh, or rather a single value in the file by looking at CSV files, commerce separated value files, JSON files, JavaScript object notation files, and also uh, how we, we can do things like imports and things like that to make dealing with files easier. Also remember, we never told the file to delete the contents, but as I said earlier, the W mode overwrites everything that's in the file. So if you open your files with W mode, they get deleted, whatever you write becomes a new content. Be careful with that. It's a dangerous operation. Use it carefully. That's it for this video. I just wanted to show you the syntax for opening a new file and two of the modes R and W. There's quite a few more modes and in the further reading section, uh, lecture of this section, I'm going to include a link to a couple more of the modes so that you can experiment with them and have a wee look at them as well. So that's it for this video. I'll see you on the next one. Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about copying a file and we're going to do so with a small exercise. What I've done is, still in my project, just to keep things simple, I've created a new Python file called friends.py and throughout this project we're going to be running this file. I've also created two text files, nearbyfriends.txt and people.txt. Inside people.txt, you can write a bunch of names. I'm going to go with the staples of uh, Teclado, starting with Rolf, of course, and uh, got in some Charlies in there. And these people are just people that are somewhere near you, let's say. Inside our friends.py file, now we're going to write a short program that is going to first ask the user for a list of three friends. Then, for each friend, we're going to tell the user whether they are in the same city. And finally, for each friend that is in the same city, we are going to save them to the nearby friends file. So it has to do three things. First, ask the user for three friends. You can do this either using the split method of string or you can ask for three distinct friends. That's fine, three inputs. Then you'll have to open the people.txt file and read all of the lines. You may, uh, hint, read lines. Read lines could be interesting uh, for this exercise. I'd recommend that you Google it and see what you can find. But of course, we're gonna implement this in the project in just a moment. So you wanna read all of the lines in people and that's going to give you a list of strings, a string per line, that's the friends, or rather that's the people nearby. Then we're going to compare the people in that file with the friends that the user entered. If the friend is amongst those people, we're gonna tell the user and also put them into this file. So we're effectively copying the people file into the nearby friends file selectively, allowing the user to choose which friends they want to copy. So I'd advise now, I know that this is a, a larger undertaking than we've done previously, and I don't necessarily expect you to be able to do this right off the bat. However, by building projects and by struggling a little bit, that is the best way to learn and to really get familiar with the research that you have to do in order to become proficient at programming. So I'd encourage you to pause the video, give it a go for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then come back and we will continue implementing this project here and I'll explain all the choices that I'm making in order to get it to work. Let's go for it. Okay, I'm sure that you at least got some place with this project. I am confident that you've managed to do some of the things here, if not all of them. Now, if you do have any trouble on your things that you're not really sure of, feel free to ask in the course Q&A before watching this and I'll be glad to help you in order to solve any doubts you have as your own research. But once you're ready, we can continue and complete this project here. The first thing to do is to ask the user for a list of three friends. So for this, I'm going to use the input function, of course. and I'm going to say enter three friend names separated by commas. No spaces, please. Now, these friend names are going to be something like Rolf, Jose, Charlie. 
Something like this is what the user is going to enter. So this is going to be a string that has three friend names separated by commas. And whenever you have a string that has a separator in it, like the comma in this case, you can do dot split. And what this does is instead of a string with two commas and three names, it's going to give you something that looks like this. That's a list of three elements. Notice how the commas are now gone. They are part of the list. And instead, the elements are made up into a list of individual names. That's what the split method does. I'm not sure if we've looked at that one before, but nonetheless, that's how you can split a string into multiple uh, constituent parts. Of course, if you had asked friend one and said input enter your first friend, that's totally cool. That is the way that I would expect you to do it if you didn't know about this split method. And that's, that's okay. Now that we've got a list of friends, and of course, if you did ask for friend one, friend two, friend three, then I would expect you at some point to have created a list of friend one, friend two, and friend three. That way, you would have a list of friends as opposed to three independent variables. This would be a great way to do it without the split function, uh, the split method, sorry. Now that we've got a list of friends though, we can open people.txt and read it so that we know the people that are nearby. So again, we're going to open people.txt in read mode, of course, because we are just reading it. We're not going to write to this file, we're going to write to the other file. And then we're going to look for the people who are in the same city or people that are nearby. People nearby is going to be file or people dot read lines. The read lines uh, method that I suggested as a hint earlier on essentially just going to read the file, but giving you a list of line one, line two, line three, line four, which is a pretty handy way of reading a file, especially because we've got one friend per file, one friend per line in our data file. So that's, that's a good way to go about it. And if through your research, you didn't quite find this method, that's totally fine. I'm sure that at that point, if you couldn't find that method, that was the point where you thought, you know, I need to keep watching this. And that's totally fine. Of course, I don't expect you to know uh, everything about files when we haven't even covered it yet. But nonetheless, it's always good to, to do some research. Even if you don't find anything, it's good to train yourself to do that. And at the end, of course, we're going to close the file. Now that we've read it and we've got our contents in this variable, we no longer need the file for anything because we can still access the variable with the values. Next, we're going to find out which people are friends who are also nearby. So the way to do that is, the best way to do that would be with a set. Um, so we've looked at sets before. What I'll do now is say something like friends set is a set of friends. This turns the friends list up here into a set, removing duplicates and also um, making it unordered and it allows us to do things like intersection, which are going to be pretty handy. Then we'd turn the people nearby into a set. So now we have two sets, one of friends and one of people nearby. So we know, of course, that to get the ones that match, the friends that are nearby, we just need to intersect them. So we'll do friends set dot intersection people nearby set. And that gives you the friends that are nearby because it gives you the elements that match on both friends set and people nearby set. Now that we've got our friends that are nearby, we can open the friends dot, uh, nearby friends.txt file. So let's say nearby friends file is going to be open uh, nearby friends.txt. And this time it's going to be in write mode because we're going to be writing some data to it. And then we can iterate over our nearby friends for friend in a nearby, or sorry, it's a friends nearby set. I'm going to call it friends nearby set just for uh, consistency since these are all called set. And we're just going to say, hey, this friend is nearby. I'm going to say friend is nearby. Meet up with them. And we're also going to save them to the file. So that would be 
nearby friends file dot write and then friend. Now, there are a couple of problems with this code here. So the first thing we, we have to do, of course, before we run it is, uh, sorry, I just pressed the Siri button there by accident, it's a touch screen, this touch bar thing. And uh, we have to close the file. Of course, remember to close it, otherwise it will keep open between executions, even after you've closed the program, not a good thing. Okay, so let's, let's run it. And we can see that it asks us to enter three friend names, separated by commas, so we can enter Rolf, Charlie, and Rudolf, for example. That one doesn't exist, but, right, we should get two, right? Hmm. We get nothing. Let's check the nearby friends file. It's got nothing. So I wonder why that is. Well, what happens when we encounter a bug? Of course, we must look at the checklist that I provided earlier in the last section of looking at our code first of all. So I'm going to minimize this thing here. We're going to once again go through this code and what it's doing. We ask the user for some input. That gets split on the comma. Now, I have quite a bit of experience and I know that this split seems reasonable. And I know that this is going to provide a list. So, okay, this looks good so far. We're opening a file for reading, and we did this earlier on and it worked fine. We used the same syntax, so this is okay. And then we're reading the lines. We, we didn't read lines earlier on, so we're not really sure what this is doing. Then we're closing the file, this seems legitimate. Then we create a, a set of our friends, and we've looked at sets earlier on, but I'm not sure if we actually converted a list to a set. So maybe this is something that we have to look into uh, before we continue. As you can see, there's a couple of unknowns in this program. Like, what exactly is read lines doing? What exactly is set doing? And then we're, we're calling it again. Now I'm telling you these are giving you sets, and this is the intersection of the two, so these should be the friends that match. But then all we're doing is opening the file for writing and iterating over the friends and printing them out. So there's really nothing that could go wrong in here. The only things that could go wrong is either read lines, because we're not really sure what it's doing. We've used it, and I've told you what it does. But maybe there's some small nuance there that we're not sure about. And of course, the set. So we didn't get an error. The checklist for error handling said that you should copy the error and go into Google, and paste it in. There's no error here. So maybe we don't want to go to Google just yet. We could go through our program as the computer, checking exactly what we've entered, exactly what it turns out, and exactly what everything does. But it's more difficult to do that because we're not 100% confident on everything that every single line of code is doing. And if you're ever at that stage where you're not 100% confident that something is doing what you expect, you have to really be honest with yourself and say, you know, I've never actually ran this before. Maybe it's doing something unexpected. And I've run this before, and so I know exactly what the problem is, but you don't know this. So the first thing to do is to set a breakpoint where you are least comfortable. Or rather, where your discomfort starts to... Well, where your discomfort begins. So set a breakpoint, and then just run the program using the debugger. The debugger is extremely useful. So as you can see, the first thing that we get is the console, and it asks us to enter three friend names. So let's, let's enter the same thing as before. Rolf, Charlie... Rudolph. So we have our friends list. You can see it down here. It's a list of three elements. So we're pretty confident on the split method. And indeed, it seems to be giving us what we wanted. A list of three elements, Rolf, Charlie, and Rudolph down there. We've then opened the file and we know what this does. It just gives us a text IO wrapper. That's just a class that allows us to interact with the file. And then we've got people that read lines. And so let's press step to the next line. And now notice how people nearby has acquired a value after we read the lines. And the value is a rather bizarre value. We've got Rolf backslash n, Jose backslash n, Chris backslash n, and so forth until Steve, which does not have a backslash n. Now, I mentioned earlier on, I believe, 
what the backslash n means when we were working on a menu for the milestone project one and it's a new line so if we open up people.txt you can see that each line has something at the end that tells the editor to go on to the next line otherwise everything would just continue on the same line and that character is the backslash n character it means new line so we go on to the next line and then new line at the end next line and so forth you cannot see that character but it exists. It is there. That's how the text file knows to split this into lines. It's not It's not magic. There is something there telling it, go to the next line, and that's this backslash n character. Okay, so now we probably know what the problem is, but let's continue into the sets just to analyze exactly what's going on. We've got a set now of three elements. Notice how they are not in order or not in the same order as before. We have a set of the people nearby, and notice how we do have the set converted here. But again, each element has this backslash n. So of course, when we do the intersection, it's an empty set. Because Charlie is not equal to Charlie backslash n. And Rolf is not equal to Rolf backslash n. So this is not going to work. And at the end, of course, we iterate over an empty set, nothing happens, and we close the file. So, what can we do? Well, the first thing that I would do is a list comprehension. And in that list comprehension, I would turn the lines into lines with no backslash n at the end. So, let's do that. List comprehension, we're going to say line strip for line in people.readLines. Then I'm going to set the breakpoint over here, and we're going to debug again. Enter our three names. And now notice how the people nearby no longer have the backslash n. This is what the strip method does. Any white space, like normal spaces, tabs, or new line characters, get removed from the start and the end of the string. So in this case, the backslash ends got removed from the end of the strings, so that we ended up just with a string with no white space. That's what the strip method does. Pretty useful, pretty useful method there. Now we've got the list of people nearby. The sets are going to match. You've got Charlie and Charlie, Rudolph and nothing, and Rolf and Rolf. So let's have a look, see if the friends nearby set does have the values we want. And indeed it does. We have Rolf and Charlie, our two friends. And to be honest, the first few times you run your programs, it may be beneficial to run through them using the debugger because it just lets you go line by line examining exactly what's going on. We've opened the file here. We're going to iterate over our friends. The first one we get is Rolf. Remember, the set is not ordered, so it could be either. And then we're printing something out. Let's go and check the console. We can see that Rolf is nearby. We should meet up with them. And then we're going to write to the friends file. That has happened, but I don't think that the file yet contains anything. It does not, because it won't be saved actually to the disk until we close the file, or until we overrun the buffer, which is not something we're going to talk about in this video, but nonetheless. And those are the only two moments when the file actually gets saved to the disk. It doesn't get saved instantly in order to uh, improve performance. So again, Charlie, same thing happens. Then we move over to closing the file, and we close it. We've seen that Rolf is nearby. And Charlie is nearby in the console, and our file should now have our friends. But of course, we didn't include a backslash n character, so these friends are all in one line. So, if we go back to our friends.py and we put a backslash n after friend, that means that when we write to the file, we'll write the friend name, and then we will also write this invisible new line character that would move us into the next line, and then we will write the next friend there as well. Also, the reason I'm adding a new line at the end is because Pepe asks me to. It's got this grey squiggly line there. Um, so, yeah. Okay, now we are happy with the way our program runs. We can remove the breakpoint and just play it in normal mode. Then we can enter um, three friends. And uh, you can see that we get Rolf is nearby, Jose is nearby, meet up with them. I thought we had an Anne in people, but I guess it's Anna. Yep. And then we can go and check our nearby friends, and we see that they are in now two lines. Also notice, though, that we have line number three. 
which is an empty line. We didn't have that in people. And to be honest, I think we should have an empty line at the end, just so every line is the same. Every line has the new line character, as opposed to the last line not having the new line character. So I'm okay with this. But of course, if you are not, you can try to experiment with your code, make it only print the new line character when you are not printing the last element of the set. You can use the enumerate function for that. I won't go into this video, into it in this video since we're getting pretty long now. That's it for this video. We have created a small app that copies a file selectively. And we've learned about a bunch of stuff. First, about the new line characters. They're everywhere and we need to strip them out if we want to have no white space. That includes spaces, tabs and new line characters in a string. We've learned about the read lines method of the file that lets us read each line of the file as a separate element in a list. I, I don't know if we've looked at the split method before, but if we didn't, then we've learned about that. If we did, we've reviewed it. It allows us to split a string into constituent parts according to a particular character in that string. And then we've also reviewed sets and using intersection to calculate matching elements. Remember I told you when we looked at sets that they would be pretty useful? They are pretty useful. And finally, we've also reviewed writing to a file, something a bit more useful. So that's it for this video. Thanks for staying with me, and I'll see you on the next one. Great job today. Hi there, and welcome back. In this video, we're looking at CSV files. Sometimes we need to store more complex data in a file, rather than just single strings as we've been seeing. And a CSV file is just the way to do that. When you need to store slightly more complex data, but maybe not necessarily too complex. Instead of storing one thing per line, now we can store, well, we're still storing one thing per line, really, but now the thing has commas in there. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to split the line by the comma, and that's gonna give us multiple pieces of data. So here, for example, we've got a name, an age, a university, and a degree that somebody's doing. This gives us information about a single person. The first row tells us the headings of the data, so that when we look at the file, we can tell what it means. The first column is the name, second one is the age, third one is the university, last one is the degree. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a program that is going to read these three lines, not the first one, and it's going to print out the information about this person in a slightly nicer way, just to experiment with reading CSV files. Let's go over to csv underscore read.py, a file that I've just created, and we are going to begin. The first thing to do is, of course, read the lines in the file. I'm sure you can do that. Hopefully you got that. What to do is, of course, open the csv underscore data.txt in read mode, and then we can look at the lines, and that's going to be file.read lines and then we can close the file. Now we've got all the lines, that's from line number one, two, three, and four, including the new line characters at the end and all the characters in the line. Now what we want to do is ignore the first line. So what to do is say lines equals lines one colon. If you remember from when we looked at lists, this is called slicing a list, and it lets us essentially get only a part of the list. We're going to change this lines variable to now be what the lines variable was, but only from index one onwards. So we're going to get index one onwards. That's one, two, and three here. We're going to ignore the first line. Of course, we also want to remove any white space, like new line characters, so we can put this inside a list comprehension that says line.strip for line in that, in the slice. The reason why I do this here instead of up here is so that we are only stripping the lines that we want to strip and not the first line since we don't actually care about it. Now that we've got these lines, we can iterate over them. And we can say that the person that we're going to analyze is the entire line, but we want to get the data in it, which is separated by commas. So what do we do? Well, 
as, as we did in the last video, we're going to split the line by the comma. So we're going to say person data equals line dot split on the comma. That's going to give us a list of various elements. The first one's going to be Rolf. Second one's going to be 25. Third one's going to be MIT. And the fourth one's going to be computer science. So the list is going to have four elements. In order to make it easier for us to work with this program, I'm going to create a variable per element. It's not something you have to do, but I sort of, I like doing that. So name equals person data zero, age equals person data one, university equals person data two, and the degree is person data three. Now, of course, you'll get an index error if your file does not have the right format, but I mean, that's uh, that's a problem in any case. Uh, whenever you're interacting with files or with databases or anything else, your program's going to be reasonably coupled to the data that you're interacting with. So, you know, that's a problem that, that we have to deal with if it happens. Now that we've got the name, age, university, and degree, we can print out a line saying, you know, this person is 25 years old and is studying computer science at MIT. So, we can print... Something like name is age, studying a degree at university. Now, the problem when we do this, let's run the file, is that it doesn't look so fantastic. You know, there's no uppercase letters, no capitals anywhere. Let's make it a bit nicer. And the way we're going to do that is by using some built-in uh, methods of the string class that allows us to add capital letters and so forth in various places. For the name, we're going to use dot .title. And that just uh, turns into title case. So the first letter of every word is going to be uppercase. For degree, um, we are going to use uh, capitalize because that turns the first letter only into uppercase and for university we're going to use title as well for that turns the first letter of every word uppercase okay let's run the file again and now we can see that it looks a bit nicer we got rolf is 25 studying computer science at mit okay th this doesn't look so fantastic but i think this is a data problem there's no way for us to know that the university is, um, is, is an acronym. So in that case, I think the data should be all uppercase if, if we wanted it to be like that. I think that's a small side problem. We don't have to worry too much about it. Of course, instead of applying Python code in here, I've told you before how I don't really like that. Uh, putting Python code inside the string, it looks a bit ugly. I think that we should instead put these title and capitalize functions um, in the appropriate places here. That way it just makes it a bit nicer, a bit easier to read. Okay. Of course, this is allowing us to read the CSV file, extract the data from it, and then potentially print it out. We could multiply things, we could calculate new, new datas, we could analyze it, whatever you want to do with Python code. If you wanted to write to the file, it's exactly the same as writing any other file, except you'd be writing a big string with various things separated by commas. Like you could write roll 25 uh, computer science, or rather uh, MIT computer science. If you write that into the file, that's all you need. That is going to mimic exactly what we've got in here. So writing a CSV just means joining the constituent values you want to write with a comma. And that's pretty straightforward. And by the way, just for context, the way you do that is a sample CSV value, is you do comma dot join, and in here you put a list of values you want to join, like Rolf, 25, MIT, computer science. And this is how you would join a list of values into a CSV. And down here, see, this is this is the what this prints out. I just wanted to give you this info just in case you want to, you know, store some some values in a CSV uh, using this syntax. String dot join 
is going to join every element of this list to each other using this uh, character here as the uh, the joining character. If you want to use a colon instead, you can do that, of course, and then your string will just look like this. It will look like the various constituent values, but joined by colons. You can use any character you want, as long as it's not a character that's going to appear inside the data. Um, for example, if you use the space to join it, you'd have a problem because one of your values has the space, and then, of course, you're gonna you're gonna uh, have multiple values. You're gonna have five values instead of four when when time comes to push comes to shove. Uh, see, now you've got a space here, space here, space here, and space here. Even though this should be one single value, that's why you have to use a value here that won't appear in any of the strings. A comma is normally a good choice. So is a colon. So is a hash symbol. These things normally don't appear. When you are then reading the data, instead of splitting by the comma, you can just split by the hash symbol. And that's the same thing. It stops being a CSV file, now it's an, instead of a comma separated value file, now it's a hash separated value file. Doesn't matter, same, same sort of thing. Okay, that's all I wanted to say in this video. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're talking about JSON files. JSON is probably one of the most, if not the most, popular format for data in the world. Especially extremely popular for web applications. And that's because JSON comes from the most popular web language, JavaScript. Indeed, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Here's what some JSON could look like. You've got some sort of curly braces at the start and at the end. Then you've got a key. Around it, there are double quotation marks, that's important. And then you've got a colon, and you can have a value associated with that key. Does it remind you of anything in Python? I hope that it reminds you of a dictionary, because it looks pretty similar to a dictionary. In fact, it looks the same as a dictionary. There are just a couple of differences between JSON, that is this thing here, and a Python dictionary. The first and most important difference is something you have to remember whenever you deal with JSON, and that is that JSON is a string. Notice how this piece of JSON here is inside a text file. And what are the contents of text files? That's correct. All the contents of text files are strings, as we saw when we read our CSV file, and as we saw when we read our plain old data file. Files, text files always contain strings only. When we read this, it will be a string, and we will convert it into a Python dictionary. The second difference is that JSON must always use double quotation marks and not single quotation marks. So if you do this, which is perfectly valid in Python, it will not be valid JSON, so don't do that. And some programs that read and write JSON require that the outermost element here, the outermost construct, the outermost structure, be an object. This thing here that we call a dictionary in Python is an object in JavaScript. They're very similar. When talking about JSON, the structure with these curly braces, we call it an object because that's what it's called in JavaScript. I know that in Python, they're called dictionaries. Some programs, however, and that's important, don't have this requirement. So in some programs, you could have a file called friends.json.txt that is just this. And this would be okay for some programs. And notice how the indentation here is slightly off. Uh, let me fix it real quick. This would be okay for some programs, but not others. Some have the requirement that the outermost structure be an object, that's a dictionary. Some do not have this requirement, and this would be fine. For our example, we are going to stick with our object as the outermost structure. So let's read some JSON using Python. Python comes with a built-in module that you can import and use called the JSON module. We're going to talk a lot more about importing as we move on in this section. We're going to be importing our own files and modules as well as system modules. So let's start with importing the JSON module. But before we import the JSON module itself, let's talk a little bit about importing. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new file that I'm going to call something like JSON imports. 
Important, do not call this file JSON, because the JSON module already exists in Python. We're going to import it like so. So if you call your file JSON, that's going to confuse Python. Try to not have your files or any of your packages named after something that already exists in Python, or indeed try not to have duplicate names for files and things like that. Just a general piece of advice there. So in Python, as we've done a couple of times before in the course, uh, sort of glanced over it, we can import things. And these things are code that other developers have written so that we don't have to write it ourselves. And now we're importing the JSON module, which contains some functions that allow us to import the JSON file and convert it into a dictionary, and also to go the other way around, turn a dictionary into JSON data. Remember, JSON data is very much like a dictionary, but it is a string. And remember that someone did write this JSON module in the same way that we are writing this file, and somebody wrote all the other built-in functions in Python, like len, or sum, or even like um, things like print. All of these have been written by someone, and they are made available to us to use globally in all our Python files. The only difference is that this JSON module is not included by default on all your files because whoever created Python thought that it may not be necessary in all cases. So the JSON module is a, a module that comes with Python, but it is not a global module. We must make it explicit that we want to use it by importing it at the top of the file like so. So we've created a file that contains our friends as JSON. And notice how this is a friends key and that is associated with a list, and that contains three objects inside of it. I'm going to try really hard to call these objects when I'm talking about JSON and dictionaries when I'm talking about Python, but please bear with me if I do make any mistakes. And these are objects in JSON, dictionaries in Python, but only when we import them using this JSON module. Then we've got the JSON file, uh, sorry, the JSON module imported. And now we have the ability to do things like JSON dot and access, as long as you're using PyCharm or something else that will uh, recommend functions, we can access the functions in that module. Notice how this JSON module is not an object, it's not a class, because we didn't have to create a new uh, JSON object in order to access things. This module here allows us to use some functions, but they are not inside a class. And indeed, in PyCharm, you can go into the JSON module uh, by uh, clicking Command click or Control click if you're on Windows. And you can see the source code of the uh, module here. You can see that a lot of it is, is uh, these comments that tell you how to use the functions. But primarily, there are some functions definitions like dump. And you can see the source code and, and what it does. You've got dump s. And you can see the arguments and the source code and all the comments and everything there. So as you can see, this is just code, like the one we write, except we didn't write it, but we can still import it. And notice how as we go through the file, these functions are at the lowest level of indentation. They are at the very left, which means they are not inside a class. So as we import the module, we'll have access to those functions directly. Okay, feel free to read through that module if you want, if you want to have a wee look at what is in there but we're going to be using only a couple of functions in this video. The first thing you need is a file pointer. For that, we're going to use the open function, of course, and we have to use an equal sign. And we're going to open the friends underscore JSON dot txt for reading. So you know how to do that. Friends underscore JSON dot txt in reading mode. Then we're going to load the contents. The way to do that is to do file contents, for example, is json.load of the file pointer. So the load function inside the JSON module takes in a file pointer that it's going to load the JSON from. As part of reading the file, by the way, this reads the entire file, it also turns it into a dictionary. So now file contents is a dictionary. Reads file and turns it to dictionary. Then of course we can close the file and now we can use the file contents for whatever we want. For example, we can print file contents friends zero. And that should print 
this dictionary here. Okay, remember, if you're using PyCharm, you may be tempted to press the top right play button, but it's likely that that's going to play the wrong file, csv underscore read in this case. So if that's the case, just right click the JSON imports file and run it. And there you have it. We print out the dictionary with name, Jose, and degree applied computing. That's what I studied at university. This is how you load a JSON file into a dictionary that you can then use as normal. So here we're accessing the friends key, and then we're accessing the zeroth element of the friends key. If you want to do the opposite, and you want to write a Python dictionary as a JSON file, that's also something you can do. For example, we are going to write into a file called cars underscore JSON. So we're going to do cars equal this list here of dictionaries. And by the way, something I tend to do, just because I program a lot on JavaScript, is have this space after the dictionary. And, um, and Python doesn't really like that. So if I do that, I apologize. I just find it a bit more readable. Um, but that's just because I, I do a lot of JavaScript and that's a convention in JavaScript as well. So now we have two dictionaries inside our list. And of course, as I said earlier, we can totally save this as JSON. It doesn't need to have a dictionary enclosing it, although some programs may request that you have that. So again, if you want to save this to a dictionary, you know exactly what to do. Open the file save the contents into the file and then close it. How are you going to save the contents? Instead of json.load, you're going to use json.dump. So here's what you have to do. Go and investigate how to use json.dump. Or optionally, just wait until after I ask you pause the video and you try this yourself, and I will implement this for you. If you are so inclined, pause the video now and give this a go. Investigate how to use JSON dump and then save this list into a new file that you can call cars underscore json.txt. I'll see you in a few seconds. I hope you got that. If you did go and investigate json.dump, congratulations, well done. By investigating, you're going to learn faster. And there are multiple ways you could have investigated. You could have Googled json.dump Python, and one of those first few links would be the official Python documentation. Another option, you could have gone into the JSON module with command click if you're on Mac or control click if you're on Windows. And there you could have found this documentation here for the dump um, function. Then it tells you what it does. It serializes the obj parameter as a JSON formatted stream to FP, a dot write supporting file like object. Now, I appreciate this is some lingo that we've got here. Serializing means turning to a string. FP is normally a file pointer. And it tells you here that it has to be a file-like object that allows you to do dot .write. That's what we've been doing with our, with our text files when we've been writing to them. So this dump takes in a object, and that's going to get turned into a string and saved into FP. Therefore, if we go back to our JSON imports, what we have to do is open the file in write mode this time, and then say json.dump cars file. And then, of course, file.close. Let's run that. Notice how it runs. Cars underscore JSON gets created, and it contains our dumped JSON. Notice, though, it's not nicely formatted, and that's fine. JSON doesn't need any new lines or spaces or anything like that. All of these are completely optional. Just notice how it's used double quotation marks, as that is important, even though we used single quotation marks in our dictionaries. Python does not care for our strings whether we use double or single quotation marks, but JSON does, so it uses that. If you had a string variable that you wanted to turn into a dictionary, you can do that. For example, let's say my JSON string is something like this.
This is completely wrong, by the way. I know very little about cars. Let's say you've got this JSON string of this Alfa Romeo car that was released in 1950. Probably pretty wrong. I'm guessing it's more like uh, much later. But nonetheless, let's say you have this JSON string here and you want to turn it into a dictionary. You can do that. But this time, instead of using load that turns a JSON file into a dictionary, we're going to use load s for load string. So um, uh, incorrect car is going to be json.load s. And notice how the first argument is a string or rather s which stands for string and that's going to be my json string and then you can print incorrect car name bane we're going batman here name there we go then you can print that um oh sorry it's in and it's in a list so of course you have to access element zero first my bad if you notice that well done and there you have alpha romeo printed out so load s allows you to turn a JSON string into a dictionary. And of course, dump s allows you to turn a dictionary into a string. Pretty straightforward to use. I won't give you an example of that because, uh, you know, if you have if you have a dictionary like or a JSON thing uh, like this one, like this list or a dictionary, you can use dump s to turn whatever construct you've got into JSON, a JSON string. So JSON allows you to use lists and dictionaries. It does not allow you to use tuples. So that's important. Just make sure to use lists and dictionaries. Don't use tuples. And you can use pretty much anything else like strings, numbers, floats. And uh, the JSON module will automatically call the wrapper function, the dunder wrapper function of your objects if you choose to include any object in here. Generally though, try to avoid objects in a JSON just because when you load them up, it's just going to be a string and it's going to be really difficult to understand what's going on. So if you want to turn your objects into JSON, which we will do uh, shortly, make sure that you describe your objects using a dictionary. For example, you can make a dictionary out of the objects, variable properties and their values. That way you can then export your objects as a JSON string if you, if you want to. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. We're going to be doing just that, exporting our objects as JSON later on in the course. And indeed, in some of the courses I've got, we, we use things like that as well. So it's a pretty popular approach um, to turn objects and to turn your variables into JSON so that you can save them into files, read them nicely, and also so you can send them over the internet, because that's a popular thing to do with JSON. All right, so that's enough of that. We've looked at CSVs and JSON, there are two very popular ways of storing data. JSON much more popular for sending data over the internet. And now that we are able to read and write data in this variety of formats, we are good to start creating apps that persist data into a disk, save data into a disk, and allows it to store it between its, uh, its run times. In the next section, we're going to be creating a nice project. But now I wanted to move on to a couple other things like importing our own files and our own modules, just so you can start dividing your program into constituent parts, as opposed to having everything in a single file. This is pretty important. Whenever you're creating a larger app, you're going to be dividing it into multiple files. So knowing how to interact between those two and how the imports work in a lower level is going to be really important. With that said, let's move on to the next video. I'll see you there. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're talking about opening and closing files automatically so we don't have to remember to call file.close at the end of every time we want to use a file. So far, we've been opening and closing files explicitly like this, saying file equals open of something and then at the end file equals close, file.close. By the way, I'll just say I've copied the code we wrote in the last section and I've created another file for it just because I'm going to change it slightly and I don't want us to lose any of the files here. These files again are all on the GitHub, so you can access them if you want. And the link to do that is at the start of this section, the first lecture. So we've been opening and closing files automatically like so. But Python actually has a piece of syntax, which is extremely handy for these scenarios. And the scenario that, that this represents is a pretty general scenario in which we have to do some setup and some teardown. The setup is we have to open the file, and the teardown is that we have to close the file. A setup is just a keyword for something that happens at the start, 
and a teardown is a keyword or, or a, a, a concept for something that happens at the end. Uh, another example would be opening a database connection at the start and at the end closing the database connection. So as you can see, opening and closing things, pretty popular thing, and, and this is a setup and teardown approach. The construct that we're going to learn about this piece of syntax that Python offers is called a with statement. You may have seen this around if you've looked at some Python code before, and they, are, they use the with keyword, and they're also known as context managers. Context managers are reasonably advanced concepts, and we're going to look at them more in depth in the next section. We're going to be programming some context managers, but I just wanted to teach you how to use them so you start getting familiar with them, and in the next section, everything's going to be much simpler. In addition, they simplify our code greatly and reduce the errors that we can cause by forgetting to close files. So instead of doing this here, we can say with open as file. Then we can do this and we can do that. That replaces our uh, previous code. Now we do with, then we open, we call the open function, and then we do as file so that whatever the open function returns goes into this variable. Then we can use that variable when we reach the end of this indented block, notice the colon at the end there. When we reach the end of the indented block, it automatically closes the file for us. This here is called a context manager, and it doesn't happen by magically. The open function has defined that it can be used with a context manager. So you cannot just do this with anything you want, but you have to define that you want to be able to use a context manager with your stuff. And if you do that, you can start using context managers like so. Again, in the next section, we're going to look at developing and programming our own context managers. But I wanted to show you this scenario in which you can use a context manager without even knowing how it's programmed to simplify your code and make it better. So again, this allows you to open the file at the start and automatically close it at the end. And the closing at the end happens because the open has said that when you reach the end of the block, the file shall close automatically. Okay, there's no magic going on here. Uh, the open function is defined to close the file at the end. Now, I'd encourage you to do the same for this file here. Replace it for, by a context manager, uh, as that's going to give you a little bit more practice uh, implementing this stuff. I hope you managed. Again, all you have to do is put the width at the start and then as the variable. The, the variable here file now gets created as the result of this open. Whatever's indented is going to be in the width, and at the end of the width, the file is going to close automatically, so we don't need file close either. Okay, notice how for JSON load s or dump s, you don't need to do any widths because there's no file to open and close. These things are just going straight into or straight out of strings, so there's, there's nothing to open or close. So that's it, a quick introduction to context managers. And they're called context managers because they help you manage the context of your application in which you now have this file open. And they manage the context by keeping the file open during the context manager and not before it or after it. So that's why they're called context managers. We're going to learn more about them in the next section. That's it for this video. I'll see you on the next one. Hi there and welcome back. In this video, we're looking at importing our own files. Importing just means allowing a file we're currently working on to use code defined in some other file. And we've done this with the JSON module in the last video. And that just meant getting the code in that module available for us to use. Now it's time to import code that we ourselves have written. That way, we'll be able to split our programs into multiple files. And that's, of course, going to help because our program will have better organization. And when it comes to changing it, and improving it is going to be a bit easier. Let's start by creating a new file inside our PyCharm project. I've created a new PyCharm project here, and I'm going to call it file operations. So that's file underscore operations. Remember, don't put any spaces in file names. That's a recipe for disaster in pretty much any computer, but especially when working with Python. Now, inside this file, we're going to write a couple of functions, one to save some content to a file and the other one to read some content from a file. 
So save to file. The content we want to write is going to be the first parameter and the file name is going to be the second parameter. And all it's going to do is use a context manager to open the file and then write the content. And then read file is going to be pretty similar. It's going to take the file name and it's going to use a context manager to open the file and read the contents out fully as a single string and return them. Now, I think you can implement this knowing what you know already. And if you have to look at the code for the section, make sure to not look at the imports project, which is also available on GitHub, but look at the other files we've already written and then implement these functions using what you already know. Don't copy and paste code, just type it out. And once you've done that, come back to the video and we shall continue. I hope you managed. All we have to do is use a context manager to open the file name in write mode. And then what we're going to do is say file.write content. Oh, sorry. Of course, you need as file in there in order to have a variable. This is optional, by the way, but then you don't have anything pointing to whatever you've opened. And then you cannot write to it if you don't have a variable that points to open. Then, of course, for the reading, we're going to do open or file name, but this time in reading mode. And what we're going to do is return file.read. Notice how this is not going to give us uh, the lines or anything like that, but this is going to be one long string that could contain things like this. See? Now, if we wanted lines after it, uh, we can split on the backslash n dot split on backslash n is going to give us something like this, Rolf, Charlie, and so forth. So this is going to give us one long string, we can then split it into lines if we want. If your file is extremely long, you may have some problems with reading the entire file at once. But let's forget about this problem for now. So this is some relatively simple stuff, We're writing to a file and reading from it, we've already done this. But it's going to be useful as an example to look into importing. And indeed, this is essentially our first library. This library, we're going to import these two files, these two functions, and we're going to now very easily save things to a file and read them from a file without having to worry about opening them. Let's create a new file in our imports project called app.py. And now we're going to import the things from file operations. There are two ways that we can do that. The first one is we can import file operations. And then we can do file operations dot save to file, whatever we want to say, Rolf and data.txt, for example. We can do this, call the file operations module. Whenever you import something, by the way, the thing you're importing is now called a module and it is executed in module mode, which is essentially the same as executing it in normal mode or script mode, but there are some minor differences that we're gonna look at in a moment. So whenever you import something, that's a module. Whenever you run something, like if you run app.py, that's called a script, okay? Normally you'll have one script, that's app.py, and a bunch of modules, and that's everything else that you import. File operations is the module, and then we're accessing inside of it with a dot the save to file function. And to it, we give the two arguments that it needs the content that we want to save and the file name. So let's right click app.py and run it. Notice how nothing happens, but data.txt does get created, and Rolf is in it. This file has been closed as well because the save to file function in file operations has this context manager which closes the file at the end. So this is pretty cool. I mean, in a single line now, because we've got our library here, we are opening, saving and closing the file without having to worry about doing that manually. The other option, I said there were two options for importing, is to do from file operations, import save to file. And then the save to file is what becomes the globally available thing in this script. And you can just run that save to file directly. Of course, this is not so good if you're importing from many places and two things have the same name. It can happen. Then, of course, Python will be very confused and you would only ever be able to use the one you import last. So if you have things with multiple, multiple things with the same name, use the former import file operations 
If you only have a couple of things that you want to import and use, feel free to import them like this. But at the end of the day, it's up to you, whatever you feel is more readable. Now, we can also have a comma after it and import write to file or read file, sorry. Save to file is write to file, same thing. Read file, and then we can print the read file of data.txt. Let's run that again. And now we get Rolf printed out down here at the bottom because we've saved Rolf to data.txt and then we've read it and printed it out. Notice how the file is opened and then closed and opened and then closed in every function. Now, in a larger application, we would start separating our files into folders so that things are more organized and it's easier to find what we need. If all your Python files, potentially many hundreds of them, would be in the same imports project folder, you would have a lot of trouble finding the things you want and it would get very messy very quickly. So instead, you normally would create a new directory. And I'm gonna call it something like utils for utilities. File operations is gonna be part of such utilities. Let's drag file operations into utils. And if you get asked to search for references, make sure to not check it, for that is going to completely moot the point that I'm about to show you. So don't search for references and press OK. Now we see a couple of things. File operations has moved into utils and red lines have appeared everywhere. Of course, this is now an unresolved reference. It doesn't know what file operations is because it's no longer in the same directory as app.py. In fact, I'll even go as far as saying it's not in the same directory imports project, which is the top level directory of our project. So you can only do this from file operations import something if file operations is a module available on the top level of your project. Okay. Because now it's inside utils, we cannot do this. So what can we do? Well, we, uh, well, we can run the file first of all to see that we get a module not found error. Just wanted to show you that this is what you get if you import something that doesn't exist. And we must do two things. We must, first of all, give Python the full path to import starting from the top level folder. So the full path is utils and inside utils, we've got file operations. So utils and inside utils and we say dot, we've got file operations. And there we have it. Now we've got utils inside file operations. And we can import these two things. Now it works. Frequently though, it is a good idea to tell Python that the utils package, the utils directory here is actually a Python package. And I'm not sure if, actually not sure if this has changed recently in Python, but it used to be that you would have to tell Python this is a Python package before you could import things from it. Uh, maybe it's no longer required, but nonetheless, for compliance with previous Python versions, it's always a good idea to tell Python that this folder, this directory, is a Python package and it's a pack, it's a folder where Python files live and where you'll want to import. The way to do that is to right click it and create a new Python file and it must be called underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. That's two underscores at the start, start two underscores at the end dot py. You can close that file for we do not need to write anything in it, but this is just what you should do for compliance with older Python versions. Okay. So now this directory here is called a package yeah, so that Python knows that it can import things from there, at least in older versions. Okay, and this is how you give the full path to Python so that it knows where to look for your uh, files. So that's it for this video. We've looked at importing our own files. We're going to look at relative imports in the very next video. I'll see you there. Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're looking at relative imports. Relative imports seem to be more trouble than it's worth in Python because a lot of people don't know how they work. It's not something that's talked about all that often. And there's a few things you have to know about Python in order to make use of relative imports successfully. Generally though, I'll say relative imports are probably not worth doing because of their limitations. Let's talk about them. In the last video, we looked at the file operations file that we've got here with two functions, save to file and read file. 
and in our app.py when we wanted to import it we did from utils dot that opens up this package utils file operations that opens up the file operations file import these two functions when we import a file like we say do this python goes to the file it navigates to it and it runs it and then it gives us access to the functions that were defined in it so if we have print whoa, whoa, whoa. if we have print hello inside file operations and then we go back to app and we run app.py notice how we get hello printed out because again when you import the file this goes to this file and runs it it defines the functions it doesn't run the functions it defines the functions it runs any code that's in there and then at the end it goes back and it gives you access to those things that you imported what's python what python is doing in the background is essentially constructing a dictionary of name of function to the function contents and that's really what it's giving you back and then you can use them as functions there so the file runs when when you import it that's something that's important to know so what we've done up here is an absolute import we have started at the top of our project inside the imports project folder that's the utils package that's at the very top we've accessed that then we've accessed the file operations and that's called an absolute import because we've defined the absolute path of imports if we had inside utils a new package called for example common this is a pretty common package name and we move file operations into there remember to uncheck search for references now we get this unknown file it cannot it cannot resolve it so what we have to do is utils dot common dot file operations we're accessing the utils package then the common package inside of that and then the file operations file inside of that and then we can import from it this again is an absolute import notice how we start at the level of app.py in every instance but that's a side effect the important thing is that we start at the top of our project okay so what if we had something like this let's create a new file inside utils a new python file notice inside utils not inside common and i'm going to call this find.py and in this file i'm going to put a function that will find a particular element inside a list so let's say find in is going to take in an iterable it's going to take in a finder function and it's going to take an expected value and then it's just going to say for i in iterable if finder i equal equal expected oh, finder i return i otherwise we're going to raise a not found error and say expected not found in provided iterable of course we have to create such an error and you know how to do that create this not found error inside this class I'm sure you managed all to do is say class not found error extends from exception and doesn't do anything since we don't have any extra arguments other than the message there now we've got this find function here and again if we go to app.py we can import it and you'd know how to import it as well from utils.find import find in and then this allows us to find in a particular list if we are in find.py and we wanted to get access to the file operations for some reason let, this is just an example then there are two ways of doing it there are three ways that people normally try two ways which are correct and one way which is wrong and this is the wrong way this is the wrong way of doing it okay so do not do this you'd think that because we are currently in find.py which is inside utils we'd just be able to say from common dot file operations import save to file and this makes sense in the majority of languages but really what's happening here is that python 
thinks that we are doing an absolute import because we've not told it otherwise. And therefore, we have to start at the top of our project. So the only correct way of doing this is utils.common.file operations, and it likes that. Another option is to tell Python that we want to start from the current folder, the utils folder. Then we can do that by removing the utils, but keeping the dot. And what this now means is reasonably inconsistent with the rest of the usage of dots in Python, but it means inside the current folder. So in the current folder, common, in common file operations. And this is now a relative import. A relative import is a, an import that starts from the current uh, the file or the current file that we're working with, and it can go down to another uh, package there. So all this is good, but there are a few problems. Here's the first problem. Let's run find.py. Not so good. We get a module not found error when we run find.py. Okay, we will talk about this in just a moment. I want to, I wanted to show you why this is not such a good idea in the majority of cases. But if you run app.py, it all works. Notice how app.py is importing find, and that is running find, which means that this code here is running too. And it's working when we do that. It's working when we run app.py, but it's not working when we run find.py. And that is that thing I was talking about earlier about running a file as a script versus as a module. There's, there's just a couple of differences in there. So um, let's talk about exactly why this doesn't work when we run find.py and why it works when we run app.py. And to do that, we have to talk about the dunder name variable. So I'm going to remove the, the actual code that we're using for we don't really care about it anymore. But what I'm going to do is print underscore underscore name underscore underscore. I'm going to print underscore underscore name underscore underscore for app.py. Do you know the value that this is going to have? I don't expect you to. But the value is underscore underscore main underscore underscore. So there's a dunder main name. Whenever you run a file as a script, that is whenever you run anything like app.py or find.py or file operations.py, then underscore underscore name underscore underscore of that file is always going to be underscore underscore main underscore underscore. So the main is always the name of the file you've ran. So that's an important thing. Let's go over to find.py then and print its name. What do you think this is going to be when we run app.py? We're going to run app.py. What do you think we're going to see printed out? I hope you thought about it or maybe even ran the code so I can show you exactly what's going on. First of all, we get utils.find because I said that when you import, you run the file. So this file operations file runs first, and then utils.find runs second. And then we print out this name here. So utils.find runs first here, and we print the name at the very bottom. And the name now is utils.find. And that's because that's what we imported, utils.find. So Python goes over here, finds the file and now decides that now this file will be called utils.find. Then we print underscore underscore name underscore underscore. And this is still main because we ran this file. Let's go over to find.py. And, and now I'm going to go back to uh, the thing that works utils.common.file operations. And I'm going to run find.py. Notice how we get main, because we ran find.py. And the name of it is always main as, as it's the file we've ran. Then if we revert back to running app, 
And by the way, I've removed the utils there. And we go to common file operations and we print the name here too. Let's go back to running app and see what happens. Okay, nothing terribly unexpected. We get main for the app. We get utils.find for find. And somehow we get utils.common.fileoperations for file operations, even though it was imported like so here. Of course, we did also import it up here, so this is the name it's got. Let's remove this import and run app again. Notice how utils.common.fileoperations is still the first file. When we do, uh, well, uh, sorry, let me explain that a wee bit. I was jumping right into something else there. When we import from utils.find, this is the first thing that happens. We go into find, and then we import file operations. So this file operations file is the first one to run to completion. We print out the name, which is utils common file operations. Then we go back to find after the import, and we run through this, and we end up printing out the name, utils.find. And finally, we go back to here and we print the app's name. That's main. As you can see, the file operations name is not .common .file operations. It is utils.common .file operations because this full stop here means access the current package in the name. So that's utils. The name of the file is utils.find. When you do a dot at the start, it says get the package utils and access the common package inside of it and the file operations package inside of it. So the end name ends up as utils.common.fileoperations. Now, why does it not work when we run find.py? Again, I'm going to import from here. Why does it not work with the relative import when we run find.py? Well, because the dot is main, and main isn't utils. So then it tries to access underscore underscore main underscore underscore dot common dot file operations, and that's not going to work because main is not a package. And this is why relative imports can be a bit of a pain. And indeed, if we run this again, you'll see that we get a no module name main.common because that's exactly what it's trying to do. It's trying to access the package of this name and just appending it to whatever it is here. Okay. So, of course, if find was in another folder, this, this package could be my project dot utils dot common dot file operations this would be the find package and it would all get appended to the start so whatever it is that find is in is going to get appended at the front and then it's going to add this at the back those two together are going to be the absolute path of file operations of course if you run find as a script you add main here which is not valid because that's not a valid package but this works if you run app.py. And it works because you've now said that find file is inside utils. So when you go into find, the name is utils.find. So what gets appended here is utils. This is what's happening in the background. So this works when you don't run the file as a script. It doesn't work when you do run it as a script. So that's it for relative imports where we're importing children. Remember, the common package here is a child of the utils package where we're currently at. In the next video, let's look at parent imports, how the file operations uh, uh, module can import, for example, this not found error. Let's go there. So I'll see you in just a moment. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, let's talk about importing parents. I'm going to run app.py again. And notice how the first file that was imported is find. 
and the find file first imported file operations. So that's the first file that runs to completion, and we print out utils.common.file operations. Find file then prints utils.find down here, and the app then prints main. Going to the file operations, how could we? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to delete this import in there. By the way, um, how could we import the parent? So in the app.py, I'm going to say from utils.common.file operations, uh, or rather import utils.common.file operations. Now this is going to go into file operations, and how could we import the not found error? inside find. Well, once again, there are two ways from utils.find import not found error. Then when we run this, utils.find will be the first line to be printed out because app is importing file operations, file operations is importing find, find is a, the file that's not importing anything, that one runs to completion, then it goes back to file operations, prints out the name, then it runs back to app and it prints out that name. As you can see, this is exactly what happens. Find prints out first. Utils.com and file operations print out second. And main prints out third. Now, if we want to import the parent, we can do that. We can tell find to go over to the parent package. And the way we do that is not with a single dot, but with two dots. Two dots say, you're inside common. I want you to go up to utils. See, notice how the, the current package is common.file operations, or rather, right now we are at utils.common.file operations. When you give it a single dot, it puts you in utils.common. When you give it two dots, it puts you in utils. Then utils.find is fine. So this gets replaced by utils. Dot, and then you can access find in it. And this works fine. As you can see, I've just rerun the app and it and it works. It goes up by two packages. Remember, we are here in file operations. It goes up two packages over to utils, or sorry, one package over to utils, and then it finds the find module there. Of course, what happens if we run file operations? Now, it says a slightly different error, attempted relative import beyond top level package. Because this is main, it doesn't have any parent packages. Remember, if this is main, it's, it's not like we can go up a package. We could only go up a package if this is um, utils common file operations. Then we can go up a package over to utils. But if this is main, we can't go up anywhere because there's nowhere to go up to. There's no other packages in the name. Okay. So this is a parent import that you can do as long as you're running this file as a module and not as a script. So it is dangerous because say you wanted to uh, print out the name of this file to find out exactly what it is. You cannot do it if it has a relative import. You can only do it if it has utils.common.find. Uh, sorry, utils.find. Now that this has an absolute import, you can absolutely run this file, and it imports utils.find, and then this one is main. So that works. So why does it work? How does it know that utils is at the top of the package when it itself is down here? Well, that's a thing for Python path. And so we're not going to talk about Python path, but just know that it defines the top level of your project. So if your Python path, which PyCharm sets for you, is set to the imports project, then you can do absolute imports starting from there. And that's the, that is the purpose of the Python path. But again, we're not going to get into it yet. We will talk about it later on when we talk about running Python from the terminal as opposed to through PyCharm. But this is why this works. So now that we've learned about relative and absolute imports, we can begin to understand exactly what's going on when we import things. And if you want to do relative imports, by all means, do them if you want. 
Just remember, you may not be able to ever run those files as scripts anymore. And running files as scripts can be handy when you want to run some particular thing in them, maybe to, maybe to debug them or to understand what's going on in a file. And so absolute imports, I think, are better, and I would encourage you to use them, but you're going to find relative imports everywhere uh, as, you, as you learn more Python. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something, and I'll see you on the next one. Hi, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at what is an import error, and also how you can run some code in a file only when the file is run as a script and not as a module. It's very straightforward. The import errors, though, are not so easy. Let's have a look at an import error. We've got app importing file operations, file operations importing find, and finds not importing anything. Let's make find import file operations. So let's do this. Let's ask it to go into file operations and import something specific. Let's, let's run app.py. Let's see what happens. Now we get an import error. Because what's happening is app is importing utils.common.file operations. This is importing utils.find. And now utils.find is importing utils.common.file operations, which is already in the imported modules. And Python knows about this. It keeps, it keeps a, a global file or a global dictionary of modules that have been imported already. And as we try to access something in it, it says, oh, wait, actually, when I try to go to this module to extract this function here, I can't do that because when I run that, it asks me to go back here. So that doesn't work. Notice, however, that if you ask it not to import a particular thing, but just to execute the module, like if you do import import utils.common.file operations, it is okay with this because it sees that it's already imported this module. Therefore, nothing to do. It just ignores it because it's already been imported in the past. I like this. Okay. So that's a pretty important thing to know. If your module is already imported, you can import it again the same way. But if your module is already imported and you want to access something specific in it, Python is going to then go and look into that module again. And it's going to um, give you an error because it's going to go back and forth. This is called a circular import. It's not such a good thing to do. Now, in some cases, a completely separate topic, you'll want some code to run. For example, let's go to the find function. You'll want some code to run only when you execute find.py. So if you run find.py, you want some code to run. And you can do that. Uh, by the way, I'm going to delete this import there because it's a, it works, but it's a sicker import and I don't like that. So if we were to run find.py, let's say we want to test out our find in function. So we'd say, Find in Rolf, Jose, and Jen. And what we're looking is lambda x, x, um, yeah, that's it. We're going to just return x. And the expected is Jose. So what's going to happen is this list becomes the iterable. Lambda x returns x, uh, which is, returns every element as we go through them. And Jose is the value we're looking for. So for i in iterable goes over each element. i becomes Rolf, then it becomes Jose, then it becomes Jen. We run the finder function, which just gives us the value. That's Rolf, Jose, or Jen. And we check that it's equal to the expected value, which in this case is Jose. And we return it if it's found. So if we run the find.py file, we get Jose out, which is good. But notice how find.py is imported by file operations. File operations is imported by app. So if we run app, we also get Jose because find was executed by the import and it ran this code. We don't want that because this is only for testing the module. We only want to run this code if we physically right-click the module and run it. If we run it as a script, 
And we can do that with an if statement. Of course, what's going to be in our if statement? We want to check whether the name is main. Go and implement it yourselves. I'm sure you got that. If name is main, run this. Pretty straightforward stuff. But of course, you have to realize that this is something you can do. After all, these are just a variable. This is just a variable. This is just a string. So you can check whether they're equal and run something if they are. Now, when you run find.py, you get Jose. When you run app.py, you don't. Because it didn't run as a script. The name was not main. The name was utils.find. That's it for this video. We, I wanted just to show you a bit more about importing, how you can run something only when you run it as a script, and also how you can cause import errors, and of course, that you should avoid import errors. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.